we'll go ahead, click record now. And so as we get into these focus group, um, focused group discussions here about perspectives of, uh, of y'all on the South Coast, we have four questions that we wanna make sure we get to in about 45 minutes. So we'll plan to spend around 10 minutes on each question. And um, I'm here to support um, with note taking, I'll, I'll screen share and I'll turn it over to Becky to go ahead and get us started on the questions that will be up on folks screen momentarily. Thanks, Jocelyn. Yes, here we go. Do, do, do. Let me click share. And please let me know if you can see my, um, my typing screen here. I'll zoom in a bit. Great. And I'll do Perfect. a test test. How's this? We yes. can see it. I can see it and hopefully everybody else can see it. Great. All right. And can someone pin, is there any way that you can pin me? Am I pinned? Can people see now the interpreter and the shared yes. screen? Can I get a thumbs up from Amanda if you can see Ashley, the interpreter at the top of your screen? Okay, wonderful. Thanks. We've done it, we've done it. And one more thing before we get started, we'd love to encourage um, if you are sharing some perspectives here, answering the questions, we would love to be able to see your video if you can keep that on. Um, and that also helps with lip reading for our interpretive services. Okay, Becky, take us away. Hi. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, you guys, you know, we really, we really want your feedback and we want to hear your concerns and priorities and, um, you know, thoughts about moving forward. And so that's the purpose of these four questions that I think if, I think a lot of you got them in the meeting registration. Um, but that's what we'd like to try to cover in the next 15 minutes. I know that's not a lot of time, but um, so we'll start with, with, you know, what role would you like your community to play in the MPA management program moving forward? And we'll try to get to, it'd be great if we could get to these, all of these questions. Um, so Jocelyn will help us in terms of trying to get there and, and get that feedback and that conversation going. So. The first question we have for you is, what role would you like your community to play in the MPA management program moving forward? So from this day on and well beyond 2022, you know, what, what role would your community like to play? Do, excuse me, do we put up our hands? How do we? That would be wonderful. Is this Peter? Yes. Yes. I thought so. Hi, Peter. Hi. So yes, um, if you can raise your hand, we'll get to folks in the order that they raise their hand. Um, and actually right now, I think I see that Dave Rudy has his hand raised. So Dave, will you kick us off with your answer about what role you'd like your community to play? Sure. I, I think, uh... It's important for the, our community, the fishing industry, to be informed from the, from the science that we've learned through this experimental process and then get the input from the industry, the, the fishermen and, and the fish buyers, as to their input uh, before this process goes all the way forward. I, I'm a little concerned that the, the process is so, so uh, front loaded, you, you have a, we have a small opportunity to give input now, and then you spend, you know, eight, nine months of crunching data. And I think it should, our community needs to stay involved through the whole process to ground truth because um, it's, it's really hard to count fish in the ocean, as you know. Yeah. One, of the, one of the ideas is to rebuild stocks. And right. to do that, we really need to have good baseline data, and good current assessment. And absent that, we at least need to know the landings, what the landings right. were before and after. Right. And that's something that um, I understand was going to be worked on, have an access to landing information that's not quite ready yet. Right. So, again, I'm concerned that 
we, we don't have the data and yet we're being asked to put, have input now before the data is really out there. Yeah, and, and thanks Dave for that. And if it helps, we don't have the data yet either. So when we, when we get that, that's what we're hoping, that's not hoping, that's what we're planning on doing is sharing it as we get information so that you guys can get it when, when we get it. So um, that it's, and, and along those lines, just a, a quick question about, about that is, what is the best way for us to share this information with you guys? What, how, how would it be best shared with you? What is the most effective way for us to do that? So there should be more meetings after okay. January where we can hear from the scientists, understand what they're seeing out there and see if it's the same thing the fishermen are seeing. Okay. The fishermen are out there every day right. and, and they may not have the same protocols that the science have, but they do see a lot of things. And I think their, their observations are important. So okay. I think it's, it's important to have that. So uh, again, you, we need to be involved in the process, not just, not just the first three months of the process. Right. And, and I understand that it'll go before the Fish and Game Commission, but this is a very complicated uh, process and complicated issue. Uh -huh. So sometimes when it gets to the decision makers, they go, well, well, this group already worked on it for a year. So, you know, we'll just go along with what they said. So there, there's, there is a lot of merit in this first report. And for us only to have, you know, a couple months input on it and then kind of be cut off until the scientists do their work, I think we're missing an important step. Okay. Can I add something quickly, Becky? Yep. Um, the long-term monitoring technical reports that um, OPC and CFW are reviewing currently will be released in January. So that will yep. be, they're, they're hefty, um, but all the data that we'll be incorporating into the decadal management review report will be available for the public to review. So all, that the new, all the new data, Lindsay. All the new data, sorry, yeah. <laughs> all the, all the new data, data. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. A lot of other people ask, ask questions and comments, but that's one. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Really, really quick before we leave Dave's comment, it sounded like, Dave, just to confirm that you would appreciate like a webinar like this with the science, like the PIs doing the monitoring. Yes, like, yes, we okay. would. We would like to do that. I just want to make, okay. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think, I think if, if, if it's done properly, uh, interaction between fishermen and scientists can be very, very beneficial. They can both learn from each other. Uh -huh. but it has to be done with the right format. There has to be you know, respect for each side. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, okay. in the last uh, MLPA process, the, the, it, didn't, it didn't work out the way it should have, just the way it was structured. And we need to learn from lessons from the last round and try to have a better structure. Okay. Do you have a suggestion as to what you mean by having a better structure? Like what sort of um, So I think, it's important, I think it's important for fishermen and scientists to start out on the same level and conversation rather than the scientists making their decisions and then, and then the fishermen having a chance to say something. I think from the very start, it's important that the fishermen and the scientists talk to each other so they can learn from each other. I was involved in one of the baseline uh, data collections with lobster. And we had, we had scientists, we had fishermen, we had uh, regulators. It was very, very productive because everybody learned from each other because we started at the same level. Whereas the MLPA process, the science advisory team was like above the fishermen and they were, it, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't always well received. And then there was problems with moving goalposts and different interpretations and new data being given to us right before decisions were made. So I think we want to try to avoid that. You're bringing back things I want to forget, Dave. Well, sorry, I, I, I do remember 10 years ago. I may not remember what I had for breakfast, but I do remember the process 10 years no, ago. No, I, I, no, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Absolutely. And I do remember that. Wonderful. So should we move on to Peter? Peter, if you can go ahead and, oh, there you go. Yes, I kind of second everything that uh, Dave has said. Uh, I think many fishermen's interest uh, is in the science. 
and what the science will show. And I'm still not clear as to whether today there's some place I can go and see what the scientific studies and their conclusions have been up to this point. Mm -hmm. And then someone mentioned new data that was gonna be available in January, but that's after any of the fishermen can either collaborate with those coming up with the new data or can comment on it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem to me to be a very good process if indeed Cal Fish and Game, excuse me, and Wildlife and the Fish and Game Commission actually want input from those people who are out fishing. Um, one thing that wasn't given sufficient attention in my view during the initial process were items like water quality, runoff from the coast, uh, what impact it has on the habitat, et cetera. Uh -huh. um, closing off 16% of California waters, in addition to all those other areas that are closed off because of marine mammals, protected species, uh, seabirds and all other kinds of things, in addition to uh, species that are being incidentally overfished, has, has really closed a huge amount of the ocean. And I don't know that offshore wind power, which is coming down on commercial fishermen with a vengeance, I don't know if there's anything that MPAs can do uh, to, to help the decision making there. But one of the big problems there is the lack of sufficiently finite data from fish and game or elsewhere to make decisions on. So I'm gonna stop there because I, I really, <laughs> You're writing down every word I'm saying, and I don't say them that well. <laughs> so, Peter, just a, a clarifying question for you on the last piece was the the issue of offshore wind and the lack of sufficiently finite data. Um, you mean with respect to fishing grounds and impacts to fishermen as a result of offshore wind, or is that is that what you mean by that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I it, this is not the right venue, but I have more information for you on that because guess what? Offshore wind is smack dab in my program. So um, there are plans, there are plans to um, reach out very, very soon to the fishing industry about all of that. And um, so just wanted to, to clarify that that's what you meant on that. And I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see. Are there other folks who would like to answer this question about what role you'd like the commercial fishing community to play in the Marine Protected Area Management Program? Or should we move on to the next question? I have, oh, I see I Nathan. have a comment. There, yeah, Nathan's hands hand up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. goodness, I had scrolled down. Sorry, thanks so much. So Peter, I'm gonna put your hand down. And then we do have two comments, um, sorry, two hands raised. And I actually don't see a name on the first. So person. Nathan, I think that you were just speaking if you wanted to go first. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think we need to have more of these meetings okay. um, just, and they need to be longer in duration. And for example, this meeting here, you know, we just had, so with some bad weather and then it's good weather today and it's good weather tomorrow. And then it's looking bad for quite a period of time. And I know there's a lot of guys out fishing today. So there's a lot of guys, this is just a complete um, missed opportunity. And mm -hmm. I, you know, we all know that's always going to be a problem. 
So we just need to have more of these meetings if we want to actually get a good representation of the commercial fishing fleet. Um, one and then two, I feel like they should be longer so that we have it doesn't feel so rushed and so that we actually can discuss a bit more uh, before we go into these breakout rooms. Um, I understand mm -hmm. you have to use the breakout rooms to to make it flow a little bit easier, but like myself, I fish equally in the central coast and the south coast. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a bummer to have to choose one or the other um, and miss out on what's being said over there. And I've I've also heard from some of my constituents that they feel like the breakout rooms is sort of like a, a divide and conquer tactic that we're breaking up the breaking up the fishermen into these little groups where we we don't have the support of each other and then things get said and we don't know what was said and um yeah so i just wanted to kind of put that out there okay. in terms that was not the intent, Nathan, <laughs> at all. No, no. Um, not at all, but I totally see where that could feel that way. Yeah, but it, it really was not the intent to divide and conquer in any way. But I do know that that it's it's comfortable to have, you know, colleagues in the room with you that that you're familiar with, and and I and I get that. So thank you for that comment. That's that's good for us to know. So this is the person that we can't see your name. If you have your hand raised, we welcome you to unmute yourself. Your phone number looks like it ends in 7121. Yes, this is Pete Alme, 7121. Uh, I, I'm going to address only sedentary species with patchy distribution. The amount of surveys that are needed for those species to be able to tell 20 to 50, 40% difference is about two orders of magnitude above what is being done. So basically you're gonna say, it could be this or it could be that. And to answer your question, the only way you will get adequate surveys in to determine maybe 20% difference from a, from a few years ago is by involving the fishing industry in the data collection. Not the review of data that somebody else has done, but in the actual data collection. And I've worked on that program now for two decades at least. The, the industry has not been very willing to participate because the department does not accept their information. Huh. So somehow the department has to say, if they do collect this data, we will accept it. Because otherwise you're gonna base it on inadequate data and, and after inadequate data doesn't matter what the science is if the data is no good there is no science okay thank you pete I'm not sure i captured the exact words at the end there but i'm doing my best over here um Thank the science so doesn't matter. Basically, doesn't garbage matter. in, garbage out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. I thought it was, I thought that's what it was, but it wasn't uh, for sure in my mind. I yeah. agree with Pete. Garbage yeah. in, garbage out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, actually, my point is, you can have good science if you have good data. The exact opposite of what you're saying. The idea is get good data so yeah. you can do good science. Not, yeah. not accept bad data and then right. you say we have bad data bad time right do right, not right. accept bad data right love it love it thank you all right do we want to move on to the next question sure let's go ahead we can always come back let's do it yeah so um the next question is, you know, what are your highest priority topics and issues and sources of information that should be considered in the decadal management review? So some of you have already said a few of these things already, but um, so that would be that would be um, the next question. Is there any way for you to copy that? There you go. <laughs> yeah. I know. Actually, unfortunately, no, I'm on oh. A, oh, a, my personal computer tonight. And uh, oh. yep, let's see. I can give it a, wit, a whirl. Give oh, it well, a that's whiz. okay. 
Yeah. Yep. That's, yeah. that's what comes to, I can help you. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. We're doing I, this together, folks. I love awesome. the team approach. And we want to hear from more members of the community. So let's talk about highest priority topics and issues and sources of information that should be considered in the drafting of this report. And you know what people are thinking, this is not the only time that you can submit these kinds of comments. Um, at the end of the, the session, we'll be putting up the, and I think it's in the chat, you guys, the, the, um, the Cato Management Review focused email address to send additional comments and questions. Um, and then, um, you know, so that's another avenue to, to do that as well. Just wanted to throw that out there while we have a chance. And there's two hands, Jocelyn. All right, by all means, call on them if you like, or- Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I think- It really goes, it goes back to what we were talking about before, getting good data. Yeah. That's the highest yeah. priority, getting good data. So we know what really happened in the experiment. Okay, great. And Dave. Yeah, you got me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is relevant here in this part. Uh, and this is um, from my own perspective as a fisherman. I believe that the MPAs should uh, rotate based on the idea that the more area that you're taking away, the higher the pressure to the areas that are not closed are. So, so when you're looking at what's the highest priority issues, a uh, source of information, um, what impacts is it having on areas that are still open where now we're all being you know funneled into one area whether whatnot this and that and uh, we can't go into this little closed areas so that's what i would like to see is a little more attention on what's happening to the areas that are not closed areas based on uh you know how how are the open areas affected by having closed areas okay and, and just as a part of that, um, there are reference sites that are being monitored as well that may help get to some of those questions. Maybe not all of it, but there are reference sites that we're looking at as well to hopefully help with that. But, and I, I'm hearing also, Dave, that your, you know, those, the rotating MPAs that are elsewhere in some areas of the globe um, is what you're talking about, right? Uh, I'm not referencing to any other fishery or group at all. I'm just merely staying, stating that there, it puts pressure on an open area to close. You know what I mean? If there's 100% of a pie and you're taking 30% away, the other 70% is now getting hit with what should have been hit with. Yes. Full, you know what I'm saying? So yes, anyways, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yes, I, under, I, I understand. I get what I was referencing, Dave, is that there are, Elsewhere in the world, there okay. are rotating MPAs. And so that that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Is that something along those lines? Okay. Yeah, I'm just not Thanks. educated on that, but- uh, Yeah, yeah, anyways. no, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I gotcha. Uh, th uh, this, is, this is Nathan speaking. I would, just, I would just like to echo and support Dave's uh, comment there. I think this is probably like the number one topic of, of conversation whenever I, I talk to you know my fellow commercial fishing friends okay. about these MPAs, everybody is talking about rotating them. Why aren't they rotated? Why are they closed forever? Or, you know, there should be, maybe there are some that are closed all the time, but there should be a separate subset that get rotated on some predictable interval. So we can start studying that. Um, and this concept of that uh, spillover and whatnot, it's, it's not proven. And I think there's a big fear among fishermen that as we are compacted into these smaller areas and we're seeing them get, you know, fished down re relentlessly, that what, that this data is going to be used against us, like that these reference sites that, you know, 10 or 20 years or whenever from now, they're going to say, look, we made all these marine protected areas, but 
we need more. They're not, they're not working. The reference sites are just getting more and more fished out. And the, the problem is compaction. So I agree with Dave. Um, we need more science and research on that. What, what uh, are the effects of compaction on resources and on the fisheries? And what is a path forward for looking into rotating some of these marine, marine protected areas? I mean, as fishermen, we're farmers and we all, you can look back and read any history for hundreds of years. If you farm the same patch of ground year after year, that patch of ground is going to go bad. You have to leave it fallow at some point. Great, thank you, Nathan. Um, this is Pete Dunham, just quickly, uh, all of fishermen know the ocean is changing. Uh, and it has been changing for a number of years, probably due to climate change and the impact it's been having. Yeah. So this idea of rotating MPAs, uh, if that would give the scientists a better handle on what's going on out in the ocean, that would be great. Okay, thanks, Pete. And Jocelyn, that's Pete F, not H. Thanks. Okay, Louis. Oh, you're on mute, Louis. <laughs> Still on mute. Can't hear you. There. Oh. Hey, my computer is cooperating now. Um, this compaction problem is 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 very interesting, and we talked about this a lot twelve years ago, or whatever it was. Uh, in addition to that, the compaction is, is made more difficult because it seemed at the time when we were picking areas to be MPAs that we picked charismatic areas that had high amounts of diversity. So in effect, we picked many of the best fishing areas. So when people say, or you say, or everybody says we have 16% coverage of MPAs, it appeared to the fishermen and to myself, who is also a fisherman, that to actually 40% of the areas that we traditionally fish were picked. So I wonder if that could be looked at uh, in view of, a of, of the effect. I'm gonna stop you for just one second. Oh, okay. Sorry, you cut out right there. Um, I heard you up to, you were discussing when this number is thrown around, the 16% number. Mm. That's where we hear, left off. Let's try it again. Can you let's, hear me now? Sure can. Okay. So 16% is, is in MPAs, but to the fishermen, it seemed like 40% of the traditional fishing, fishing areas were put into MPAs. And so I'd like to have that reviewed uh, many of the areas that we were shifted into were areas that were less productive and had less diversity. Uh, for, for instance, mud, sand, uh, uh, areas without kelp, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. And um, for uh, you know Amanda and Jocelyn, if you guys can help me see hands, I'm scrolling, but I, you know, I can only see so many boxes at a time. Yes, so not I'm, a problem. Uh, yeah, and um, and if if you guys are not, if you feel like you're not being seen, you know, just shout out, and we'll we'll go from there. So, any other comments from anybody on this particular question? All really um, good. Very helpful. Hey, Kelly, we have both Dave and Merritt. Um, so this is Bruce Bruce Steele. Oh, oh Bruce, oh, too. Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Um, Bruce, we actually have, sorry, this is a little bit silly, but um, I see hand raised and I want to be really respectful of that. So I'm not sure it sounds like they're talking to me. <laughs> okay, well, why don't we just hear from you, Bruce? And then um, I think Dave and um, maybe Merit. others will be, Merritt will be okay yeah. with Bruce going. Okay, let's do it. Go for it, Bruce. All right. All right. So you guys can hear me? We can. All, All right, right. Sorry. sorry. I was on the phone because I didn't know how to put my hand up. <laughs> uh, 
anyhow, I was just, the thing that strikes me is as fishermen, when we went through the process, we weren't asked, you know, to make goals for it. Those were set for us by the law. Um, and we didn't get to set the science either. That was set by, you know, Blue Ribbon Task Force and the Science Committee. So effectively, the only thing that fishermen really got to do in the process was to comment on economic impacts of specific areas that hit the science goals. I mean, that, that's effectively all we really had any choice in doing. So now we're in the process and I don't see where economics are involved in the questions. Um, but it's kind of relevant that after the process went through, they had some big squid years and they used those numbers to maybe bolster people's, people's um, to bolster the, the, the MPA process that look, there's money made even after it was done, but the squid years have passed. Mm -hmm. And it, it really shouldn't be about money now compared to money before, because the things that cause squid to go up in value happen to do with it. it's a worldwide commodity market. Lobsters, same thing. The value goes up or down, not because of MPAs, but because of worldwide prices. So... I, I, anyhow, it, it's just a little frustrating that we're getting asked to review kind of goals that we had nothing to do with setting, and we didn't really discuss that much in the process. So we should really be asked to comment on, on, on like what Pete and Dave are saying, the science, or how how the economics of what's happened over the last 10, 15 years are relevant to, to the closures. So, so anyhow, money needs to be inserted somehow, but fishermen need to have some sort of voice in interpreting that debt. Okay. So socioeconomics and human dimensions, Bruce, is what I'm hearing. And when you say about the goals, you mean the MLPA goals, the Marine Life Protection Act six goals, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah okay. was that before we had anything to do with it. Yeah, right, 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 right. I gotcha, thank you. Okay, I think, I don't know whose hand was up next, but I think uh, Merritt. I can't see you. You're somewhere, I know. Oh, Ashley. <laughs> Can't hear you, Merritt. Yeah, I'm muted? trying to get to the there screen that allows me to unmute. Have you got me now? Oh, yeah, we do. Now we have you. Yeah. All right. The raise hand option and the mute, unmute are on two different screens on my device. Uh oh. At any rate, I want to bring up a uh, topic that, that Lily had addressed. Uh, yesterday, and that's why I raised my hand right after we spoke and didn't go to it. But it turns out in stock assessments where um, fisheries dependent data play a big role, especially in the data moderate or data limited stock assessments, the closed areas that we have, both for uh, utilitarian conservation, the RCA and the CCA, and for um, our marine protected areas here in the state are playing havoc with the ability to gather data that really reflects what the stocks are. For example, those fisheries dependent data do not sample within areas that are inaccessible to the fisheries. And they also do not sample within areas that are inaccessible to the sampling effort, which has really impacted both the, the quillback rockfish and the copper rockfish data moderate stock assessments more recently. And that's what I have. I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave Rudy. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Merritt. Actually, Merritt, did you have? Do you happen to have that written down? 
I, I can write it for you. Well, or do you mind saying it one more time? I'm sorry, I did. I was having a, a little blip in my technology. And so if you don't mind saying it one more time, I, I did a crappy job um, recording. Uh, the crux is marine for areas that are inaccessible to the fishery play havoc with stock assessments. And, and, and if it should be addressed in, that, in the 10 year review and there is science that supports it. Got it. Need to address this in the review. And there is science yeah. that supports this idea that the yeah. areas that are inaccessible to right. the fishery. So Daniel Orlando just published and Ray Hillborn has a lot of stuff that speaks to this issue. Uh, Dan Ovando is the name of the author and, and all. Um, there are a bunch of co-authors with it, Jen Cassell and so forth. Yeah. And Ray Hillborn has some modeling work that supports that same idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Merritt. Okay, Dave Rudy, one more uh, question and then we'll go on to the to the next one, which I think sure. you guys I, I, have, I have a couple quick comments. One is... Sure. Uh, when we were uh, given the advice from the science advisory team 10 years ago, we were told that in a state marine conservation area, there were certain species could be taken that would not devalue the, the value of the marine protected area. Uh -huh. And I think that needs to be reviewed too. There's things like sea urchins, which a um, number of us advised the uh, process that by not harvesting sea urchins in a marine protected area, you might have a problem with too many sea urchins. And we were told, uh, don't worry about that. There'll be a trophic cascade. The lobsters and the sheephead will eat the sea urchins. Everything will be fine. The density will drop down. So we'd like to see, get some current science advice and see, you know, have a discussion over that to see how that worked out. Okay. Um, the other thing I think is relevant is just, you know, the, what M, the role of MPAs in terms of um, how successful they are in different in different scenarios. So if you have no fisheries management, MPAs have been shown to be very successful. But in areas where you have good fisheries management, MPAs have shown to be less successful. Uh -huh. I think that's important to you know, look at that again also. Okay, great. That's really good feedback, thank you. So I think looking at the clock, we'll move on to the, to the next question. And, um, that one is how would you define measure and or assess progress towards Marine Life Protection Act goals? And this goes back to those goals again um, that we were all given within the legislature for the Marine Life Protection Act, those six, those six goals. So, you know, think I think of this question is how would you define or measure or assess progress or success? Is the best way to look at this question from my perspective. Yeah, Dave Rudy, is your hand still up? Or did you put it up again? <laughs> I put it back up again. Okay. So right. I, I, think, um, I think one of the goals was in this experiment was, you know, did this process, you know, increase the, number, the amount of fish in the state and therefore would it increase the commercial landings and benefit the fishermen? That's something that, and, and one of the goals talks about rebuilding stocks. Right. So I think I'm addressing that goal. And again, right. as, as was mentioned before, we didn't have any input on the goals. Right. But the one goal that we that the fishing industry looked at is, well, maybe in 10 years, we'll be so happy because there'll be so much more fish in the ocean, we'll be making more money. We'll love these MPAs. And that's, that's what we were told happened in New Zealand, for example. The fishermen just loved them and they wanted more of them. And I don't, I don't think that happened in California. Uh, but I think that's that's something that um, we that the fishermen considered a potential goal is more fish in the ocean so we right. could harvest more fish. Right. And I'd like to know if if there are more fish in the ocean, and you know the the data is going to be you know based on models, which a lot of us have doubts about models. So you know we we need to listen to fishermen. We need to look at fish landings too. Yep. And fish landing should be measured on pounds, not on value. Because yep. as was said recently, you may have a spike in the lobster price, 
That doesn't mean there's more lobster in the ocean. So don't, don't say that, oh, look, the fishermen are doing better because they, right. they earned more dollars. We need to look at how many pounds of lobster were removed before and after, not how many dollars. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm scrolling to see if there are any other hands up. Um, I don't see any, but welcome. You guys, you know, you, it's okay to think about the question a little bit before you answer, if you want to answer, if it's easier for you to provide, you know, answers to these questions, like I said, to the website or to the email address later, that's fine too. Um, and I think but, we have maybe one thanks. hand up. Is that Louis? 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 Oh yeah, Louis, there you are. Hi. I keep scrolling and I miss everybody. So yeah, and then Nathan. So Louis and then Nathan. Go ahead, Louis. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> Thank you. You're very gracious. There you go. Um, as I said yesterday, and being involved in the PFMC for a number of years now, um, one of the goals in the Magnuson Stevens Act is to provide protein to the nation at the same time maintaining sustainable ecosystems and fisheries. So I would like to see how the MPAs have contributed to that goal. Okay. Great, thank you, Louis. Nathan, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I would just like to like to add uh, kind of what what Dave Rudy was going on there is like no don't just look at um, pounds look at dollars and also factor in how fisheries have changed has the market changed is it um, is is the is the product marketed differently has that driven a change a change in price are fishermen are have fishermen changed their habits maybe they're no longer fishing for volume they're fishing for quality so uh -huh. um, this is this has impacted like the landings or shifted landings to a, a certain area or, you know different from historical patterns pre right. pre mpas um, and also the economic the economic costs and i guess for lack of a better word like the the um the opportunity cost or like the safety cost of forcing fishermen to work in different areas, areas that are maybe weren't their historic areas and having to travel further, you know, to go past, uh, to, to go past an MPA to get to an open fishing ground. Um, and how, I mean, it seems that the state is trying to go more green or eco-friendly in everything we do. And it, it seems um, to me to be kind of in opposition to those goals or trends if we're having to travel further to go get to a good fishing area because we've got to we're motoring through these marine protected areas to get to the mm -hmm. other side all the time you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so louis is your hand up again oh no okay i just yep. <laughs> want to make sure um nathan Yeah. Did you a, yeah. Go ahead. Did you, your hand was up. Oh, um, no, I'm I'm good. You can take it down. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, great. Thank you, and guys. Just a friendly flag that we've got about two more minutes. Okay. Um, so maybe Becky, should we open up to this last question? Sure, we can. It's it's a it's a broader question about any basically any other reflections or recommendations, you know. Um, with regards to the to the management program and the role of the ocean community and the broader and the broader program, so basically, any other reflections or recommendations that um, you'd like us to to have? Great, and I see Dave C. and then I see Dave Rudy. Oh, Our Dave's. Let's open it up. Dave C. will go in alphabetical order. Dave okay. C. Come on down. That's go ahead, funny. Dave. Yeah, I got you. That's funny. We're actually on another committee, Dave and Dave and Dave. And Dave. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so uh, I do want to make sure because I may not be able to say this when we go back to the main screen, is huh? we definitely need more time to discuss this stuff. This sure. is like, like, we there's, you know, we're only about five or six of us actually 
participating at this time, but if the meetings are longer, we're going to spark some more conversation from other people. So this like one minute, I mean, one hour, but it feels like one minute is like not enough time at all. And just however you can figure that out, something has to happen that way because you're not going to get the voice. You're going to get some, a few, but you're not going to get the actual voice on return. So I save more time. If in case, I, in, case, in case I don't get to say that. Then Thank you, Dave C. We got gotcha. you. Okay, Dave, Rudy, and then Peter. So I agree with, with Dave C. We need more time. We need more meetings. Don't rush this through or you're going to get unhappy fishermen. Uh, the other thing is, I'll 